The next session is going to look at the give and the take between buyers and sellers in negotiating key provisions and deals. And so I think you'll enjoy this uh, discussion. And Bill's going to introduce himself quickly and the rest of the panel. So take it away, Bill. Yeah, thank, thanks, William. So uh, good morning, everyone. Um, my name is Bill Minot. I uh, lead our uh, transactional uh, solutions practice at Willis Towers Watson. Uh, my perspective is focused on reps and warranties, other M&A insurance products, uh, tax insurance, M&A contingency products. So the emphasis on that part of it is going to be on, on how M&A insurance is impacting deals, and that's going to be a big part of our discussion uh, this morning. But we'll also talk about some of the other um, uh, give and take in terms of negotiating deals with and without uh, reps and warranties insurance. So. Um, I'll let our panelists uh, introduce themselves, starting with uh, Kelly Silver to my immediate right. Hello. Hi, I'm Kelly Silver. I am Deputy General Counsel of a company called Marion Nutrisciences, which is a food safety and quality services company based here in Chicago. Um, we are very much involved in uh, a lot of M&A activity, especially in the past eight years or so. Um, internationally, so a little bit less in the U.S. as we are overseas, but things change year, year to year. Great. And my name is Ian Ross. I'm a partner with uh, Concentric Equity Partners. We are an investment firm here in Chicago. Um, we're generally buying maybe one to two platform companies a year and lots of add-ons, so uh, kind of in the middle of uh, these types of things all the time. Hi, my name is Jessica Siksu. I'm a partner at Kirkland & Ellis. And uh, in the private equity group, and I focused on rep and warranty insurance product for our private equity and corporate clients. Uh, hi, everyone. My name is Kun Libakin. Uh, I'm a senior M&A underwriter with AIG. Um, AIG started um, this product, I think, a very long time ago. Uh, <laughs> but of course, you know, it uh, has seen a really big peak. Um, so happy to be on the panel today. Yeah, and I should, uh, special thanks to Kuhn because she didn't know she was going to be on this panel until about an hour ago. Uh, so she boldly agreed to come on short notice. We had one of our panelists who, who couldn't be here because of a, uh, an emergency. Um, uh, so, so thank you, Kuhn, for stepping up on, on very short notice. So she has no time to prep, but we're confident that Kuhn's going to be a, a nice value uh, add here to our discussion given her perspective. And, and I know we've spoken on panels with Kuhn before, so uh, familiar. So, um, so to start things off, you know, in terms of, we thought we'd talk a little about what we're seeing in terms of some of the trends with, in particular, you know, reps and warranties insurance. Um, and certainly from, from our perspective and what we see um, on transactions that we work on, we're seeing a lot of different dynamics in the market. Uh, we're seeing pricing, you know, come down on, on rep and warranty insurance. We're seeing deductibles or retentions come down we're seeing it become more relevant in the lower middle market uh, in transactions, you know, in the in the 20 to 50 million dollar range, certainly 20 to 100 million. I think earlier on it was more of a, a true middle market in that 100 to, to 500 million dollar uh, deal size. We're also seeing it be used on, on very large deals as well. We've, we've <coughs> placed insurance on uh, last year one transaction that was a seven billion dollar transaction. Um, I know there's been a, a, a 10 billion dollar transaction. So we're seeing it on very large deals. We're also seeing it move to, to smaller deals. There's an increased number of, of underwriters, uh, and the, and the long-term underwriters like AIG have, have staffed up, and they have very large teams in place now and ability to handle all sizes of deals and, and, and to turn things around. Uh, in terms of some of those retention figures, we're seeing in 2016 the average retention on, on a policy, and retention think deductible, um, uh, was a little over 2% of the transaction value. Uh, over the full year of, of 2017, that dropped to 1.75%, but towards the end of the year, that was more like 1.5%. I think we're trending now towards 1% um, on, on many transactions. Uh, one other trend that we're seeing, and, and, and Jessica is going to talk about some of the trends from, from k &E standpoint in one minute, but, uh, and some of these are consistent, we're seeing more no seller indemnity you know, transactions where, where the, the, the rep and warranty policy is the sole recourse except for perhaps fundamentals or fundamentals and tax. And uh, from our statistics, that increased from 21% of the deals we did in, in 2016 to 32% uh, of the deals uh, we placed insurance on in, in 2017. And one other you know, kind of macro trend uh, I'd like to mention is 
is we're seeing more corporate, you know, corporate buyers use it. And that, that number went from about 20% of deals of the policies we placed in 2016 were, were for corporate buyers. Uh, and in 2017, that increased to about a third uh, of the policies we placed. So, so definitely seeing more and more corporate buyers become um, acclimated to using uh, reps and warranties insurance. And I'll turn it over to, to Jessica. She's going to talk from Kirkland's standpoint what, what some of the things are, they're seeing. Yeah. So um, I wanted to focus um, and do a comparison between 2016 and 2017 and how the use of the product has increased drastically. I mean, from the beginning, you know, when we started, you started, what, in 2012, even maybe before. So if, what you have there is we focused on transactions that have an uh, enterprise value between 100 million to a billion, which is really where this product um, is used the most. So when you see, and we also divided all deals, which includes, you know, whether, um, <coughs> so what we're seeing on the, on the chart, it's percentage of deals with M&A insurance. So that's rep and warranty insurance, mostly. Um, and so in 2016, 51% of all deals, whether you had a private equity buyer or a non-private equity buyer, that means a corporate client, 51% uh, of the deals were using rep and warranty insurance. In 2017, 60% of the deals are using private equity insurance. Um, eh, sorry, rep and warranty insurance. Um, when you focus on PE buyers, which were the ones that were using the product the most from the beginning, in 2016, around 60% of PE buyers were using the product, and in 2017, it went up to 65%. I would expect this to continue, uh, this trend to continue. The biggest change, like uh, um, we said before, is uh, the use for corporate clients. So corporate clients were very hesitant to use the product in 2016, but I think it's been so ingrained in the way that middle market deals are done these days that they understand people have to use this product in most of the cases for the middle market. So you see a big jump in non-PE buyers from the use of the product in 2016 for 26% to 42%, and I expect this trend uh, to continue. The other thing that is not on that chart, but I think it's uh, interesting, is I also looked at the use of the product for deals that are between 50 million and 100 million, and the percentages more or less remain the same. But then when you look at deals that are 50 million below or 1 billion and above, then those percentages start to shrink. So really that shows that the product is being used in middle market deals and it's now being used more in lower middle market deals which is between 50 and 100. And um, you'll talk about uh, also, we are starting now also to see insurers insure deals between 50 million and below. Um, and, and I think it's a matter of, um, I don't know if you can hear me, um, matter of capacity. Uh, we have more underwriters, so you know, as a company, it wasn't like a conscious choice to just do the big deals. I think it was just a matter of resources, and now we're like, we've, we've doubled our team, so we have more capacity to um, underwrite the smaller deals. Um, I think, you know, the um, interesting trend is, you know, you were talking about more corporate clients and, you know, I always tell people that usually they're very reluctant first buyer because that's not, that's not the way they've, uh, they're used to doing deals. So it's a, it's a big cultural uh, gap that they have to overcome. Um, but when they do it and they get comfortable, then they use it as a tool for their next acquisition. So. That's really something that we see, which poses challenges. I mean, we'll, we'll also talk about that because they do deals differently from a PE firm. Yep, and we're certainly going to get into that in a few minutes. Um, uh, before we do, I wanted Ian uh, to talk a little about kind of what you're seeing in your deals, both on the, on the buy side and on exits, and uh, you know, with and without insurance, some of the dynamics uh, you're seeing in the current marketplace and how you're, how you're negotiating uh, and structuring transactions. Sure. Yeah, and a lot of it comes down to who you're negotiating with. So we tend to buy companies or recapitalize companies from the founders or the individual one or two people that own it. And a lot of times the discussion goes, you know, here's the reps and warranties. You know, you're not going to sell us a surprise that we don't know about. And they say, of course, there's no surprise. There's no problems here. 
Um, and we say, well, gee, we could buy an insurance policy for a couple hundred thousand dollar premium that will uh, alleviate you of that liability. And they say, well, no way. There's no way there's a hundred thousand dollars worth of problem here. I'm not going to buy the policy. So many of our deals at the beginning, um, you know, will get uh, lots of um, good, good reps and warranties, lots of indemnity from the founder. Um, they'll often have a rollover investment with us. And so we'll say, well, gee, you can pledge your stock. Um, so if there is a real problem, you could settle it with stock. Uh, as a way to be kind of user friendly to the seller. Um, the flip side of that is we tend to sell through investment banks, through auctions um, when we exit, and most of those deals have had reps and warranty insurance. So I think of the last five deals that we've sold in the last two years, I think almost all of them have had reps and warranty insurance. And so that, and that's usually because, um, you know, as a seller, of course, you don't want to hold on to liabilities. And we're not the ones that are running that business day to day. So we don't, I, I can't sit there and say everything is perfect. Um, so that gets priced in by the buyer, and it becomes a little bit more of a market. And so um, our experience has been uh, we haven't bought it on the buy side, but we almost always have the buyers buy it on the sell side. Yeah, and for those of you who haven't used the product, um, what rep and warranty insurance does, it's basically it shifts what was used to be the seller's liability for closing to the insurer. And so, for example, let's say in a deal where you don't have rep and warranty insurance, sellers is on the hook post-closing for 10% of the purchase price. Uh, with rep and warranty insurance, what we do is that seller is only on the hook for 1% post-closing, and then the 9% it's uh, handled by the insurance. So it's a really attractive product for a seller to uh, require buyer to buy rep and warranty insurance. And then it has a bunch of benefits for the buyer as well. Uh, because it allows you to, and we'll talk more about that, Bill, but um, it allows you to negotiate in a less controversial way rep and warranties. It allows you to, in case of a claim, deal with a third party, no emotions uh, with founders or, you know, rollover sellers. So it has a bunch of different advantages, but I think yeah. we're going to talk about that later. <clears throat> yeah, we're going to get into, into some of the nuances of that, um, certainly as we move forward through the discussion. I wanted to get, you know, Kelly's perspective, you know, as a corporate buyer, you know, what you're seeing in your deals, what kind of deals you're doing, what, you know, what some of the issues are. Have you seen reps and warranties insurance um, where you're not using it? You know, how are you structuring deals, et cetera? So kind of what are you seeing in the market? Sure. Um, so at this point, you know, we are, you know, as Ian said, we're, I mean, we're really only on the buy side. Um, and we're looking at targets where, um, it's typically the founder um, or family-owned small business owners, and they're certainly not pushing this on us. It's 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 you know we're really the ones who are structuring the deals, um, and there really is no you know interest in it when we're buying directly from the founder to have rep and warranty insurance for us. Um, we're seeing the product a lot more now um, as private equity um, becomes more you know acquisitive in this life sciences area um, and is more competitive for us. So certainly on their exit, they're, they're forcing it on us. And so that's where we're seeing it. Um, for the challenges, and, and I forget, maybe it was Jessica who mentioned it before, you know, for us, we haven't actually closed it on a deal where we've had to purchase the insurance. So we've gotten close, and one reason or another, it falls apart. But for us, we are kind of that new buyer of this product and so it's very difficult for us and for me you know especially to kind of change you know the expectations for our management in terms of we're very familiar with our process when we're doing these deals all the time and you know we know how uh, the representation warranty negotiations are going um, but then you throw in insurance as another element to it and that be creates a whole other level of complexity whereas I think the point of this product is to streamline as much as possible. Yeah, and, and we certainly get that <clears throat> that concern, you know, quite a bit from corporate buyers, uh, particularly early on when they, you know, the first time it, it's bringing a whole other party to the table. How is it going to impact the negotiations? Is it going to impact the diligence? Is it going to slow the deal down? You know, what is the insurer going to going to want from us? Um, um, and uh, and then we find when we we've, we've done <clears throat> once we're through that that first deal, um, I think as a general rule people get more comfortable that it's not as intrusive uh, as people fear it. It doesn't really impact the diligence exercise um, um, and, it, and it generally you know, works. If there's truly known significant issues on the transaction, 
then it becomes more challenging. You know, then, then if, there, if there's things that are uh, known items that you typically have a specific indemnity in escrow for, uh, then the, the equation on using reps and warranties does get more challenging. Uh, but if, you, if those are, uh, and those get magnified, I think, sometimes on smaller deals um, than on larger deals where some, some of those issues are maybe smaller scale relative to the deal size. Um, uh, but, but we do see then it, it working and people coming back um, uh, and using it again. Uh, but, but it is that first process. So um, maybe, Kuhn, you can talk like from the corporate, when you're working with corporate clients, you know, what do you, you know, do you need to see, because uh, 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 corporate clients don't have necessarily outside advisors preparing, you know, a legal report, uh, a tax report, a Q of E report, uh, um, um, you know, they're doing a lot more internal diligence. How do you manage that from the underwriting process, and what, what do you need to see? Yeah, so, I mean, usually we would like to know beforehand, you know, at the quoting stage, if you know that, um, you're, I mean, as a corporate client, you know, this is the way we do deals. We have our own internal team. Uh, we produce, you know, a very, like, short summary. I mean, for us, anything that you can provide us is great. <laughs> um, so. And, you know, you, you memorize it. It could be a one-pager. So we can do deals with that. So it's not an obstacle for us, you know, to underwrite deals where you don't have um, necessarily, you know, all the advisors report that we get, you know, from a PE uh, client. Uh, but it has these ch this challenges, you know. I think we have to spend a little bit more time during the underwriting call. Uh, making sure everyone um, is on the call that participated. So. You don't have awkward um, silence when I when we ask questions because uh, that happens. Um, but you know, I think only time will tell us. You know, there's a big tell to these policies. We are starting to see you know an uptick in corporate clients. I think we're going to see in the next years. You know, when we look at our claims, you know, really where where do we see them? You know, is it? Mm -hmm is more. corporate, you know, more challenging because they have this um, confidence in their process. They know the business, but, you know, their tax review versus, you know, an EY tax report is not going to be at the same level of detail. So I think, I think only it's out there, so we'll, we'll see, but we'll, um, we will underwrite, you know, with, you know, whatever your internal process is. Yep. And so, Jessica, in terms of negotiating the indemnities, um, when you have reps and warranties insurance, typically it's purchased to sort of the size of a general indemnity cap. And then you've got, you know, fundamentals and, and, and tax, and which are often, you know, not capped um, at a general cap. So how, do you do, how are you seeing that addressed in deals with rep and warranty insurance? Yeah, so I think... Um whether you have a no seller indemnity deal, that means that the seller is not on the hook post closing for anything, or you have a seller indemnity deal, it's still very deal specific. Um, however, a very interesting trend that we've seen since um, from 2016 to 2017, if um, again, same on using the same parameters, so deals between 100 million to 1 billion, in 2016, deals that had MA insurance. Um, that had no seller indemnity deal, i.e. the seller was not on the hook post closing for indemnities, was more or less at 17%. But in 2017, no seller indemnity deals, and this is for uh, where you have a PE buyer, by the way. But in 2017, it's at 31%. So to me, that shows that the use of this product is allowing or is um, causing the increase of no seller indemnity deals which of course, if you're a seller, it's awesome. Mm -hmm. uh, and um, so I, I still think it's still dynamics. I still think, and I tell this to my seller clients, you should be able to stand behind your fundamental reps. Those are very few. Uh, you should be able to say that you own the stock and that you, have, you can sign an agreement. Uh, and then um, for fraud, I mean, everybody should be able to stand behind fraud. Um, for tax, that's, I think, where this product is very interesting because, for example, in true no-seller indemnity deals, what would happen is that post-closing, any pre-closing taxes that were owned by the seller 
um, you know, in, in deals where you have salary indemnity, then the seller would be on the hook for those. But in true no salary indemnity deals, all that risk is shifted to the insurer. And, um, you know, they, they do a lot of diligence and um, there are certain specific exclusions on taxes when, uh, when the insurers cover taxes. But I think that's a very interesting trend. Yeah. Uh, so, Kelly, from, from your standpoint, does it, you know, I know with some of our corporate clients, they get concerned because we, do, we do see some private equity sellers not want to stand behind the fundamentals because they're late in fund stage and they just don't want to have those indemnities out mm -hmm. there, um, not because they're not comfortable with the fundamental reps they're giving, but just from a, from a risk allocation standpoint, um, don't want to have those indemnities out there. Um, uh, I mean, fraud, I think people do you know, stand behind. Uh, but you know, fundamentals and tax, if they're capped at that 1% exactly. escrow, that can cause, um, you know, sort of particularly a corporate buyer. I mean, you, I would think, want to see higher caps on exactly. those things. Exactly. Or how do you deal with what yeah. are your thoughts on that? We, I think have a lower risk tolerance. So again, it's, it's also for us about, you know, shifting the mindset where it's a whole different ballgame when you're buying from, you know, PE firm versus seller oper or owner operated business um, in the, the comfort that we're getting on those reps and warranties and what they know and understand about the business and the operation of it. Um, so that is a, something that has been very challenging for us in the negotiation is that seller indemnity is something that we still will want. Um, and, you know, from the private equity, from the seller side, that's, you know, that's really where the rub is for us a lot of times. Um, again, it hasn't played out that we've really seen it, you know, seen what happened. Um, but it's certainly, for us, it's just it's, it's managing that expectation and, you know. Yeah, and we're, and we're hearing that from some of our other corporate clients. And, and we've actually, there are, um, um, we, we have been able to create product that basically provides a backstop for fundamentals above, you know, the general cap amount and also, you know, true fraud, you know, from the buyer side protection uh, at a much lower price than, say, the, than you'd pay for, you know, per dollar of coverage for the general rep and warranty policy. And some of our corporate clients are, you know, who are more risk averse and, and don't like that gap of not being protected on fundamentals up to the purchase price or at least up to maybe 50% of the purchase price are, are starting to, mm -hmm. to be interested in, in that coverage to, to, as, as the product migrates more to the corporate side, um, we need to address some of these concerns uh, that corporate buyers may have that are different than, than maybe a private equity buyer. So, um, so Ian, from, from your standpoint, when you're dealing with, say, a founder, um, I mean, does it, does the, I guess entering the equation, because I think we're going to see this kind of move more to the lower middle market. We're starting to see that. But in terms of the dynamics, if you did have a dispute, you know, how do you feel that that would be, you know, do you want the founders to have skin in? Do you, do you, um, uh, uh, is set off stock always going to be, uh, are their stock rates going to really make you whole? I mean, right. and, and sort of the dynamics of now you're trying to build this business and if there's a breach of rep claim, you know, is it, potentially attractive to be going against making a claim to Kuhn instead of, you know, against the founders. Uh, I mean, what are, what are some of the thoughts, you know? She looks a lot uh, easier to get. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. She um, is. Yeah, you know, there, there's just, <clears throat> at least for us, we like to have alignment. So we like to find founders who want to own part of the stock. They don't want to sell. They often say our value is not high enough, so they want to own a piece of it. Um, and I think about it in terms of the company's evolution. So small companies tend to have uh, limited resources, they don't have a lot of the good materials, whether it's audited financials, whether it's um, you know, good legal representation, whether it's um, just being able to really go back and diligence things. And so um, in my mind, we often buy companies where there's just big risks. And I think a lot of times bigger private equity firms will say, well, holy cow, you, know, you need to have X, Y, and Z. Um, we tend to structure uh, rollover stock as, as kind of the first claim. Um, we will have a go back, and whether it's in an escrow or um, some other provision. And, and generally, I think about it like auto insurance. You know, if I, if I rub my car up against the wall, I'm probably not going to call the insurance company and get a little bit of paint fixed. But if you get in a gigantic accident, it's all bets are off. Um, and so we tend to think about the insurance as sort of catastrophe insurance as opposed to, you know, a nice pocket to go dip our hand in if, if something comes up. And so 
Um, with that mindset, we think about kind of evolving that company over time so that they have better systems and better things in place so that when we do go to exit it eventually, um, we think there's a much more refined market. And you know, you talk to the good folks at k and &E, they would tell you there's a pretty tight market around reps and warranty terms um, at that $100 million plus exit size. And so um, I, we just think about it as, uh, and I almost make it personal with a founder. I say, listen, I'm putting my own money in here. Like, tell me, is there a problem? And they say, of course not. And I say, well, great, if there is, you gotta make it right. And, and that dynamic tends to work pretty well. It's not perfect, but um, uh, it, it's the one that we prefer. Yep, and, and uh, Jessica, when you're representing buyers, what are some of the, you talked about, the, the, I mean, the advantage to a seller is pretty clear, you know, getting out of a deal clean with either no or very limited. And then we would, you know, what are some of those, as you, as you negotiate, as you see this from the buyer's standpoint, it, I, you know, we do see some advantages from the buy side, so maybe you can elaborate uh, on that. Absolutely, so from the buy side, Having rep and warranty insurance in your deal helps tremendously negotiating the reps in the transaction. So what would have taken before a week to negotiate a set of reps with a seller because the seller would have some higher amount of post-closing indemnity, now it has become a pretty uh, good process. And um, of course, you're not gonna have a deal where you know, the reps are so ridiculous that you know, seller's gonna make reps that they really cannot stand behind. So I think the process has worked pretty well. We have very middle of the market reps uh, throughout these deals that use uh, rep and warranty insurance. And so for a buyer, it's much better. We get more disclosure. We understand the business better. Uh, we have more sincere conversations about the company. What are the issues in the company? And so I think overall, it's a much better process uh, for the buyer because you just get to know the company better just by just having that easier a way on uh, dealing with the reps and warranties. Another thing that I think it's very positive is uh, post-closing, if you have a claim, um, you are dealing with a third party that knows how to deal with claims that have done it for many, many years. And so what we've seen, in, the, like Kuhn was saying, in the rep and warranty insurance market, what has happened with these insurers that participate in the market is that they have full teams solely dedicated for rep and warranty insurance. They have full teams that are solely dedicated to deal with claims uh, related to rep and warranty insurance. And so it becomes a very, I mean, the, depending on what the claim is, I'm not saying that the process is easy, but because you know some claims are very difficult, for example, if you have a multiple, uh, but it, it, it is a very straightforward process. Uh, it's a very tight community, so people know each other. Uh, and it's, you gotta think about rep and warranty insurance very differently than you think about other insurance, because in other insurance, I think in people's mind, it's like you have, oh, the insurer is here to not pay my claim, right? And it's very, very different in the rep and warranty market. Uh, the, the insurers, and Kuhn, you can speak more about this, and Kuhn will tell you, and any insurer that's uh, here will tell you. But if you have a valid claim, and you are able to prove your damages, and those damages are covered under the rep and warranty insurance policy, you're gonna get paid. And, um, you know, I think there's a reputational issue. If insurers are not playing nice in the sandbox, the word is gonna go out. And uh, there's so much insurers participating in the market that it's a very competitive uh, environment, which is very helpful for a buyer. Um, so, I mean, Kun, you can talk more about yeah, this, mean, but. Uh, I mean, as you know, the product has gained in um, popularity, I mean, just by the sheer volume, we're seeing more claims. Um, so we're seeing notices of claims that don't go anywhere, and then we see cl proper claims. So I think the, the one thing to, to really remember is that you're basically giving us, you know, this letter, this claim. We do not have any information. We can't, you know, we don't have access to any of the companies, the targets books. So what we're asking you is really to tell us, hey, this is the breach. This is, you know, our loss. This is how we came to that number. And we start the discussions. Um, because we, you know, as you said, it's a valid, if it's a valid claim, we'll go through and, you know, our team are spot on with, you know, the uh, tenure in, in experience. But do not view it as, a con you know, adversarial. I think that's, right. that's the worst thing that can happen um, is to view it that way. It's not. Because, right, you know, when you put that claim in, we do not have any information about you know how to even quantify it 
So help us. Help us get there. We'll get to the solution together more quickly than you know, just standing by and saying, no, I want my check. You know, that's, that's not going to work. So. Yeah, and we just went through a, a situation um, which happened to be with AIG, which um, was exactly that. I mean, there was a, it was a financial statement uh, breach situation. Um, the AIG obtained or engaged a financial, uh, you know, financial expert. They were asking for information around the accounting treatment, wanted to see some source documents. Um, our, our client was candidly pretty skeptical that, you know, whether this was actually ever going to be paid. and and uh, kept on pressing on timing and, and all that sort of stuff. And it did go, uh, but, and there was some follow-ups, but really I would say at the end of the day, um, uh, you know, once all that information was provided and all the, all the documentation was looked at, you know, we were very happy to see uh, uh, them come back and, and recognize the claim in full and, uh, and, uh, and not even come back and say, we think it's a valid claim, we're going to pay you 80 cents on the dollar um, they actually paid 100 cents of the dollar. So I think our client was pleasantly surprised uh, to see that. Um, um, and, and there's, yeah. there's kind of an evolution in that market, too. Yeah. I mean, I think in the last four companies that we've sold, we've, the buyers bought rep and warranty insurance. The insurance companies are smart, so they read all the diligence reports. And, um, you know, usually there's one or two big items that uh, the buyer looks at and says, hey, that's a risk. And the insurance company says, great, we'll insure everything else. So as a seller, you kind of agreed to you know market terms yep. up front, and then in the end, we've had to end up having escrows anyway. And so I think part of the insurance product, it's, it works best with really big companies where you can sort of bury a little stuff and it doesn't become a big mover um, in the smaller end. And the insurance companies are definitely moving into it, but um, as a seller, you just got to be pretty careful because I think if there's a known identifiable risk, um, those reps and warranties is all about risk sharing and who has to pay if something goes wrong post closing. Um, you know, it, you can't insure away a known problem. And so you have to kind of think about, um, does it make sense or not? Yeah. And for us, I mean, this is where it becomes most attractive to, for us as a buyer um, and to kind of get us over this hurdle of the complexity that there may be and the unfamiliarity of using this product um, while we're negotiating. But for us, most of the time in our acquisitions, the seller stays involved um, likely as like a general manager of, of that line of business. And so to be able to, if there is a claim, to go to a third party and not disrupt that in, the relationship that we have ongoing with the general manager who we have to rely on and trust, um, that, is, that is really where we're finding like the greatest, there would be the greatest value. So that is kind of how we are shifting our mindset as we look at this. And that is one of the, the true, when you, in terms of rep and warranty, the process is initially to, to sort of spec out quotes, you know, with, with fairly limited information at that point. You've got information on the company, the purchase agreement, um, uh, you know, kind of higher level information. But then when you engage insurer to start underwriting, that's when they're going to get into the data room, get their, their lawyers into the data room. They're going to start looking at the diligence reports. And, and so, and if there are truly known adverse findings and diligence, those can be the, the, the pressure points that can result right. in an exclusion. We do spend a lot of time negotiating to avoid those exclusions, trying to get additional information. And, and, and we are successful in that in a lot of situations. Uh, if we can provide additional information, how, how you got comfortable. There's two ways you can run into an exclusion once you start underwriting. That is you know, truly known issues that are adverse findings and diligence. The second is, which, we sh which you should, it's really important to try to minimize this before you start that insurance diligence because it, it can be mitigated, is the scope of diligence. So it's important that you have uh, engage your broker and your counsel with the insurer before you select an insurer in terms of how much, what diligence you've conducted. Um, uh, and I want to touch on audited, audited financials here in a second. But, and particularly if there's foreign operations, you know, uh, are you engaging local advisors or not? It may not be fatal if you ha or not, but it's good to have that discussion before you start underwriting so there's an alignment of expectations because mm -hmm. it might be very, very reasonable from a scope standpoint. They've got a small sales office in the UK with three or four people. We're not going to engage local tax counsel or local legal counsel um, because we don't think it's material. Um, uh, but but you, on the other hand, without insurance, you're not going to get an exclusion that says we're not going to cover anything arising out of those UK operations, you know, so 
So those are some of the issues that it's important to negotiate as much on, on the front end and, and get an alignment of interests and expectations as to, as to the scope of diligence uh, and what's going to be available. Because uh, the more discussions you have on that before you select an insurer, you know, the less likelihood you're going to have um, uh, issues you know, when you get into that underwriting process. Um, so in terms of you know, some, some of the lower middle market deals, a lot of lower middle market companies obviously don't have audited financials. Um, that was historically more of an issue with reps and warranties insurance. We're definitely seeing more uh, ability uh, uh, by the insurers to underwrite you know, financial statement reps. Now, the financial statement rep, you know, there, there could be gap you know, areas where they're not following gap, you know, where we have to deal with those issues. But uh, maybe, Kuhn, from, a, from your perspective, when you're looking at maybe a smaller, a lower middle market deal, the company has reviewed or potentially compiled you know, financials, um, how do you look at that? What, do you, what are your thoughts? What do you, what do you need to see in diligence to, to still underwrite a policy that, that covers a, a rep around the financial statements? Yes, as you said, um, Bill, uh, it's better to tell us up front, you know, so we're prepared. But, you know, we do deals with just reviewed financials. Um, I think those deals also tend to be in industries that are a little bit, you know, I would not say simple, but you know, simple to understand. Um, hopefully, um, so it's it it hasn't been really an an issue. Um, I think going back to smaller deals, what I mean, it's the issues of smaller deals. You know, smaller deals are usually you have a very shift, a big shift in negotiation power. You know, you have a, a buyer who has a lot of you know cash and the seller is not so, so you already have, you know, this imbalance. Um, the scope of due diligence usually is more limited. You have uh, less retention. So for us, you know, as an insurer, the retention and the level, the deductible, you know, as Bill said, is really important for us because on, on the bigger deal, we can absorb a lot of things. You know, we say, oh, okay, it's a 40K issue fine, you know, because I have a one million retention. When you have a deal that has, you know, just a hundred K in deductible, it doesn't absorb much. So that's <coughs> where, you know, the challenges are. Um, so, you know, when we look at financials, we just take that into account. I mean, the complexity of the, uh, the industry, I mean, what are they doing? I mean, you know, which jurisdiction? Um, and we can, you know, we have resources internally to help us, you know, we have, um, um, but that's not, that has never been like, um, I think, an obstacle to writing deals. There are others. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and, and, we're, and we're definitely seeing that as well. We're seeing a lot of deals get done with, you know, with reviewed financials, with unaudited financials, with not even reviewed financials. You know, typically you need a Q of E uh, mm -hmm. analysis uh, to, uh, on the buy side, you know, to, to get, uh, to get uh, the, rep, the financial statement reps on the right. If they're, you know, the financial statement rep itself, you know, may not be a full gap, you know, financial statement rep, or the policy, to the extent your Q of E identifies, you know, areas where the financial statements are not gap, um, you know, those are probably gonna be carved out of, of coverage um, uh, as to them not being gap. Uh, you can't rep that they're gap when they're not gap. So, so you got to work through some of those issues in terms of the language of the rep and, and the diligence. Um, you know, without um, you know without audited financials is our experience certainly. So, uh, but we are seeing uh, policies get placed. We're seeing the premiums get much lower. Uh, minimum premiums. We're seeing uh, premiums. Uh, you know, certainly under two hundred thousand dollars. You know, approaching a hundred thousand dollars with some insurers on smaller transactions with retentions, and, and the bigger obstacle used to be retention or the deductible because if insurers had a 500,000 or 750,000 minimum initial retention and you're doing a $20 million deal, you know, or $30 million deal, you couldn't do a one percent, you couldn't cap the sellers at 1% and take a 1% buyer deductible. It wasn't enough retention. Um, and now we're seeing those get done with more traditional with a buyer maybe only taking a half a percent, you know, retention, the seller's putting a half to one percent in escrow. So and the premium being being lower. So that's why, you know, one of the reasons we're seeing it more used in the um certainly the lower middle market deals. I, I do want to leave some time for Q and A. We were gonna to touch on cross border deals uh, briefly because this is a 
if you're doing acquisitions overseas, there's definitely a global market, you know, for uh, rep and warranty insurance. It's a little different animal uh, when you get um, overseas. So maybe, uh, Jessica, do you want to touch on that uh, just briefly, what the difference is, what some of the issues when you're doing a, a cross-border uh, transaction? Yeah, so when we're doing cross-border transactions, so let's say a target has substantial operations abroad. Uh, in some other country. So what I tell my clients, it's like, you better hire lawyers, whatever, we have substantial operations, due diligence, because otherwise we're gonna end with exclusions that we don't want. Uh, the other thing that we try, it's when we have cross-border transactions, the rep and warranty market in Europe, it's very different than the rep and warranty market in the US, and Kun can talk more about that. But when we have, uh, so it's much better in the US. Uh, you get much more coverage in the US. And so when we have cross-border transactions, uh, what we try to do is work with insurers to have, if we have a U.S. style purchase agreement, which again, it's very different than <coughs> European style purchase agreements, but to the extent that we have a U.S. style purchase agreement, we also try to have a U.S. style rep and warranty insurance. And insurers have worked with us uh, to do that. Sometimes they have to underwrite their, the deal from London or from Bermuda, because if there's more operations abroad than in the U.S., then they have to deal with that. Uh, but in uh, cross-border transactions, um, to the extent that we're doing a typical U.S. deal, we will push for a typical U.S. policy. Yes, and I, and I think, you know, it just helps being a, a global company that we have um, this, res you know, this huge resource. I mean, we do deals in Asia, PAC, in Europe, um, in the U.S., and we can use that really for, for our clients. So. You know, if you want the um, purchasing entity to be a Norwegian entity, we can place it on a Norwegian paper because, you know, that's um, also mandatory. So in the U.S., you can only have a U.S. entity as a name insured. Um, if you want another foreign entity, it will have to be on that local paper. So it just adds an, another level of complexity. So just be aware of it, you know, tell your broker, your, your attorneys right away. Um, but we can do it. So, you know, we can have a Cayman name insured, we can have a Bermuda, Cayman in, uh, Bermuda name insured, um, um, and we have that capability. Yeah, and it, but it is important to have that discussion. Insurance is a regulated industry, mm -hmm. so an insurer has to be licensed in a jurisdiction where they're issuing a policy to that counterparty, they're insured. So if that counterparty is a, is a, and there are some jurisdictions that have very high premium taxes, so we can help, you need to navigate that through for, you know, I think Dutch premium tax is like 21% of the premium. So, um, uh, you know, whereas in U.S. surplus lines tax, what we have is more like three to 5% of the premium. So, so there can be financial impl implications uh, to depending on where the policy is uh, uh, being venued. So, um, so I, I think we, um, it, one other thing is we do run into tax, if you run into tax issues, so we talked about some of the diligence findings. We're working on a transaction right now, um, actually with some of Jessica's colleagues, where there's a founder-owned business, a, a, a kind of a larger founder-owned business in the tech space, but there is a, there is a, there is a, a question about the S-Corp status, you know, whether stock was uh, for a short period held by a non-qualified S-Corp you know, shareholder you know, I think everyone thinks the risk is very low, you know, that, that the S Corp could be successfully challenged, but it's a risk the buyer doesn't want to take because the, the consequences can be very, you know, Big. obviously dramatic if the S Corp is disallowed. Um, uh, and then you have all this built-in game and loss of, you know, deductions potentially in the future, et cetera. So there are, you know, we've got a tax insurance policy we're putting in place on that transaction to deal with that specific issue. So if there are issues that are, kind of known risks and particularly outside the ordinary course issues on tax, uh, like an S-Corp status, like NOLs. You know, there are real, there, the, the tax insurance market is growing. I know AIG's got a, a full-time tax underwriter now. There's several other insurers that have uh, full-time tax underwriters. So it's just something to be aware of if you, if you are doing a transaction and there is a tax issue that, that you identify. Now, if it's truly a, you know, a dead bang, you know, we're liable. It's probably not insurable, uh, right. but but if it's something that there's, you know, some identified risk around, uh, but some valid defenses to to a claim, but the and the consequences could be significant if it's if it's uh, successfully challenged, 
by the IRS or, a, or, or a, another stat, uh, tax authority, you know, there, there can be a tax solution, tax insurance solution around some of those issues. So, um, so I thought we'd open it up, you know, for, for Q&A, um, and we're happy to take any questions, uh, you know, from, from, uh, you know, from the audience. Are there any noticeable trends in terms of how the premium, the cost of the premium is being shared or borne by the buyer and the seller? And is that in any way impacted by, you know, these changes in retention that you're talking about? Um, I'll comment on the other comments, but we're, we're seeing um, it varies. Uh, in terms of trends, I, I would say if, on auctions, we see probably a higher trend toward the sellers try, you know, telling the buyers to, to, to pay for it and factor it into their into their bid, although I mean, we also see sellers tee it up and agree to pay half of the retention and half of the cost of the policy up to a reasonable level of coverage. So we do we still see it split. Um, uh, it's probably less common for this. If this there are still some situations where the sellers do fully fund it, I think, but that's probably less common than it was. We don't always see, and the insurers I th are agnostic, I think, about who pays uh, yeah, for the yeah, premium. Really um, <laughs> it's more of a deal point. But uh, Jessica, what do you uh, see? Yeah, on so, that? so uh, before the trend was, you know, buyers on the hook for 1%, sellers on the hook for 1%, and that, you know, that would be a 2% retention. Uh, these days I'm seeing, uh, you know, because the retentions have been coming down, uh, and they continue to come down. Um, what we've seen is maybe buyers on the hook for 0.5 percent, the sellers on the hook for 1 percent, and you know that makes up your retention. In true no seller indemnity deals, which again when you have the wrap and warranty product being used, we're seeing an increase. Then buyer eats the 1 percent retention, and so buyers on the hook for the 1 percent, and after you've met that retention, then you can go to the insurer. What, what about the premium payments? Premiums have come down too. But who's paying? Who are you seeing? Buyer. Buyer, a hundred percent. Most of my deals, the buyer pay, pays for the premium. Very, in very few cases, it's uh, split between the seller and the buyer, and the prices are coming down. So, you know, last year we were seeing between uh, three to four percent, more to the between three point five to three point seven percent. Now we're seeing more between three to three point two percent. So premiums are coming down as well because you know there's more people using it, there's more participants in the market. It's more competitive, so in I would I want to say 98 percent of my deals buy. Pays yeah, and for our it. premium numbers uh, validate that. We and this includes some excess policies. So the rates are a little lower, but the average uh, rate in 2016 was 3.4 percent on policies we placed, and in 2017 it was 2.9 percent. Hmm. But that does include sometimes on larger deals you're putting layers of policies, and the rates are going to get much lower as you get higher up. So it's probably more aligned with what you're seeing on the primary, you know, the first layer of, of coverage. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Right here. How many insurers are in this market? So, as... <laughs> Too many, Good will tell you. Yeah, prices are coming <laughs> down, but, uh. So, uh, over 20. So, t 21, 22, depending on, you know, where we are exactly today with a couple of new entrants, but uh, uh, there's definitely at least 21 markets, if you will. Some of those are, so, so um, there's direct insurers that write it directly, like AIG. Uh, we've got a couple others here in the audience. So HCC, which Tokyo Marine HCC, QBEs, uh, and I think XL Catlin uh, is here also. So there, there are direct insurers, but then there are also what we call managing underwriters, groups like Ambridge Partners or Concord, which syndicate risk for multiple insurers. Uh, and uh, so so there can be multiple insurers that participate on those programs. But in terms of like people we go to to get quotes from, there's over 20 now in the U.S. market. And, and, and that number is also you know, globally. There's different insurers. There's overlap. AIG is a global market. When our London team has access to some insurers that don't write in the U.S., you know, there, we have there's some insurers that write U.S. deals that don't write you know, global deals so, uh, or deals outside the U.S. Um, but that's, that's where the market is. I think in the back we have a question. Um, what number do you anticipate if it's a, a situation where the uh, seller is not, cannot self-insure, so it's not a big, large public company that has enough resources where the buyer wouldn't even demand an escrow in the first place, in a situation where there would otherwise have been an escrow, what, situation, or what numbers at Kirkland on the sell side do you think are used? And assuming that answer is 
90 to 100 percent of your deals because it, it almost if if it uh, if that is the case uh, where the escrow is replaced why do you think that the broader market hasn't adopted it more is it because of lack of sophistication of uh, lawyers uh, wh why do you think these numbers are still so low I'm, I'm so by the way these are all deals where Kirkland represents it's not only buyer it's, it could be we could be buyer or seller it's these are where Kirkland has been um, representing could be buyer or seller uh, the difference, it's like I, I did the stats based on if you have a PE buyer, which is traditionally the ones that have been using more of the product, and when you have a non-PE buyer, which is corporates, where we see now an increase of using the product. But it's whatever Kirkland was representing, either buyer or seller. And I would add, I mean, I think most of the deals that we've sold where there's an investment banker that's running an auction, I mean, 99.9% .9 of the times yeah. they say, boom, dr drafted into the first draft of the purchase agreement, it's going to be just the buyer has to price it in. So I think on the sell side, it's probably all of them. Um, but I, I, on the buy side, I mean, there's a lot of situations where people are recapping a company with a founder individuals. And it's not lack of sophistication. I think it's just it becomes a negotiating dynamic, and it's a question of is there enough value there? I mean, we know it works for the insurance companies because there's a lot of them, and they're competitive, and they're getting smarter and um, coming down market. But in the end, you have to ask yourself, is it worth paying a couple hundred thousand bucks for this policy, and does that – does that buy the risk off that I, that I think it does? And that, that's where I think the, the, those are probably the deals where people are not getting it. Yeah, but w to answer your question, Scott, when, you know, when we are representing sellers, it, like you said, it's, it's, we assume that there will be um, rep and warranty insurance uh, at the buyer side. Because, you know, again, we're doing these middle market deals where it's used uh, broadly. Yeah, and we're even seeing sometimes corporate sellers when you're selling a... Yeah. A division or a piece of the company, you know, go to market with a rep and warranty check, rep and warranty insurance back deal, um, which we weren't seeing certainly a couple years ago. Yeah. Yeah. The question is, you know, how much is going to be the seller on the hook post closing, and I think that's, you know, deal dynamics, negotiation. Um, okay. For, yeah. We have time for one more question. I have a question for Jessica. Do you also have data to show during those two year period? Uh, with all the insured um, companies, and um, what is the claim rate, and uh, how long is the average time take? Uh, you know, the insured <coughs> get a claim done. Yeah, so it's a great question. Uh, AIG has done a market study on claims based on uh, their data, and Kuhn can talk about that. At Kirkland, we don't see that many claims. You know, our clients are pretty sophisticated clients. They do extensive <laughs> diligence. Uh, when they go and buy a company. So the claim rate, it's really for that unknown situation. You know, somebody was cooking the books or somebody made a mistake in the books and nobody knew. Uh, so our rate claim, it's pretty low, actually. We are seeing more um, because just the product, it's being used more, um, but it's, it's pretty low. Uh, and, you know, Kuhn can yeah. talk more about claims so for AIG. Yes, because, you know, it's, it's such a, que a question of volume, you know, how much volume do we have so we can extract meaningful data. So this year we're going to publish again, I mean, probably in a month or two, our claim study. And it shows, like, you know, a trend. Like, the, t the one that we're following is private equity insured versus corporate, because mm -hmm. I think it will be interesting going forward. Um, and, you know, in areas, you know, is it still financials? I mean, do, you know, we have a, a, an increase in compliance uh, reps being breached. I mean, and I think that's, that gives you, you know, some idea of, oh, okay, maybe in the U.S. this is where, you know, you see most claims. Um, outside of the U.S., these are the areas that you should maybe focus more because it's very different jurisdiction by jurisdiction. Um, so, you know, we can give you a trend, and, you know, that's the, the report that we publish. Um, I think the length is just hard because, you know, we're not talking about an auto claim, you know. Not all claims, you know, you can't just put them in, in a box and, you know, just compare all claims. Um, I mean, some are super easy. I mean, you have a third-party claim, the IRS comes and just writes a letter and says you haven't paid X amount of money. There's not a lot of dispute in that, okay? So it, it gets resolved very quickly. Um, if you come and say, hey, you know, there's um, an issue with the inventory and we suffered X loss and we feel like it's a multiple 
laws, you know. Um, this, we're going to the more complex claims. So, you know, you have an, a whole like, gamut of uh, complexity. And that's where, you know, we're going to, it's going to take more time just to analyze and go through the documents. And I think it's added when we don't have that cooperation. So that, you know, hence my going back to please be straight and, you know, um, to provide as much information as you can to back up your numbers. I mean, it, it seemed basic, but it really helps in, you know, us understanding where you came from, where the numbers come from, and then we get to a landing pretty easy. Um, one claim, I mean, that I, um, like, on one of my deals, I was like, <gasps> the first, you know, <laughs> one of my deals, um, was a, um, a class action on misclassification. So an IT company, um, the deal was done super fast. And I think that's the challenges that we face right now also. Buyers are very eager to purchase targets. They're given like two weeks to do everything that beforehand, you know, you had like three months to go through. So that's another challenging aspect. And I mean, to tell you the truth, I mean, we had like a, a great memo from the lawyers saying, you know, misclassification is like no issue. We've, we've We've looked at everything. But you know, in the US, I mean, all it takes is one person, you know, getting another 30 person, and then you have a class action, and you, you're counting millions of dollars. Right. So, you know, it, it goes, through, you know, sometimes it gets, it, it is contained in the retention, in the deductible, sometimes it goes beyond. But it doesn't take much. And it's pretty easy. I mean, you have a class action, this is what they contend. Who wants to fight a class action? Most of our clients wants to settle. So it will be a settlement, and it will be a question of what, you know, what is the number? And AIG, I mean, we as an insurer are very experienced in managing those claims. I mean, that's what we do as a living. So we can also help, you know, contain those risks and, you know, get to a settlement that is beneficial to our clients and to us too. So I think it's very hard to compare. I mean, you have to look at each and every um, claim and their complexity. And by the way, with respect to the multiples, right, which is uh, most the most complicated ones, when you have a, a breach on the financial statements wrap, um, that is a difficult claim. Either you're dealing with a seller, right, if the seller would have been on the hook and there wouldn't be rep and warranty insurance, or if you're dealing with a rep and warranty insurer. Those are just difficult claims. You have to hire expertise. You have to prove how you got to the multiple, why it's a recurrent um, issue in EBITDA, is it not? And those are just complicated by nature. It's, it's not a matter of whether you have the insurer or the seller. So, so I know we're definitely out of time now. I see William encroaching. So, uh, so I uh, thank you, everyone.